Hey everybody, it's Troy Hinky with the Urban Worm Company. Welcome to another edition of Wiggle Wednesday. Um, you may notice the background is different today. I'm at the Chester County Public Library today in Exton, Pennsylvania. Um, I've got to get to my daughter's school for a holiday thing after this, and so I had to make different arrangements today. So uh, feeling a little out of sorts as well because I'm in a different place, but. Uh, I'll give just a minute here for more people to come on. Welcome from Colorado. Hey, Susan. Uh, maybe hopefully Susan's back. She said she was here early. Hey, Kevin. Hey, Prawn Solo. Uh, today we are going to be talking about feeding worms. Uh, we'll be going through tips on um, collecting food scraps and feeding worms. Um, just a, kind of a quick... Uh, uh, sorry, I'm uh, not thinking well today. Um, it's going to be a bit of a shorter episode is what I'm trying to say. Uh, the past few episodes, I've gotten into more detailed subjects on worm anatomy and things like that, and they've been a bit more drawn out. But hopefully this one will be just uh, 10 or 15 minutes to go through, and uh, I won't keep you for a bunch of time here. But um, let me pull down these banners here, and I can start getting into it in just a few seconds here. I'll check where everybody else is from. Salida, Southern Colorado. Uh, Susan is back. <laughs> Good morning, Chef. Northern Florida, Alabama. Hey, everybody. I am going to get rid of this banner at the bottom here. Uh, so again, uh, just a reminder uh, for those of you who may have not been here when I've been presenting by myself, but when I'm here by myself, I'm not able to see any comments once I get into my presentation. Uh, so if you ask any questions, I will get to them at the end. I'm just not going to be able to see them immediately as I'm presenting. So I'll go through the presentation and then uh, we'll do a Q&A at the end as usual. Uh, so here we go. Just one second here. I got to find my uh, find my other thing to take it down. All right. And I'm going to bring up my presentation here. So we're at December 14th, week away from winter here and almost the end of the year. Uh, so today we're going to go through worm feeding tips from Chef Troy RD. Um, so we'll talk about collecting food scraps, um, just some tips on like how myself and Steve do it. Um, and then we'll be go through different ways of preparing food scraps for the bin. And then we'll kind of quickly go through feeding the bin, although we've covered that in another episode of Wiggle Wednesday or uh, a blog post. I couldn't remember. I was trying to bring up a link for it, and I couldn't remember where that was. And then at the end, we will go through our regular Q&A. So welcome, everybody. Um, and we'll get into worm feeding tips. Let me make this a little bit bigger here so I can see better. All right, so collecting, as far as collecting food scraps, um, you can collect both pre and post consumer food scraps. So that means before and after you've cooked it. So if you're chopping up your carrots, you cut off the tops of your carrots, that can go in your worm bin or be fed to worms. Um, and then after you're cooking your food and you didn't eat all of your rice or you didn't eat all of your broccoli, um, you can put that in the, in the bucket as well. Um, People talk about, I'll just mention real quick in the beginning here, you know, people talk about meats, dairies, uh, dairy products, uh, citrus, and um, onions. Uh, I will mention that, you know, all of those things are going to break down. The reason that we usually want to keep meats and dairy out of uh, worm bins and home composting is because they can draw pests and rodents, and we don't want that. Um, and they can be a bit can add a bit of nastiness to a worm bin. Um, so it's best to keep those types of things out. It's best to stick to a, a vegan diet for your worms, I guess. Uh, and then uh, I mentioned it multiple times, uh, onions and citrus fruit uh, are not going to be harmful to worms. Uh, citrus fruit does have a acid in it that uh, can be harmful to worms, but they are going to avoid that in the bin. So if you throw some uh, you know, orange peels into your bin, the other organisms are going to break that down and your worms will avoid them while that acid's breaking down and then they'll come in and chew through that. So um, you can put onions and citrus in there. So 
Uh, any types of food scraps, what I do uh, and what Steve I know does as well, we had a conversation about it, is have a, a bucket with carbonaceous material. So I get a free bucket from the bakery. Like you can go to, uh, I used to go to Kroger or now I go to Giant where I live or whatever your local grocery store is. And you can generally go to the, um, the bakery section there and ask them if they have any um, icing buckets. And normally they are throwing them away or recycling them or just get, getting rid of them. Some places like Walmart will reuse them for oil, or I know a lot of the Walmarts do, they reuse them to fill with cooking oil. And then so uh, they're disposing of the oil that way, but you can get these nice little three gallon buckets. I like them because they're a bit smaller than a five gallon bucket. Um, and then you're not collecting, you're not having to collect too much it's you know normally a week's worth or depending on what season it is and how much uh food fresh fruits and vegetables you're going through but um those those buckets those icing buckets make a really good uh collection for keeping in your kitchen so what i'll do is take um like those free newspapers that you get in the mail or when you're leaving the grocery store i'll pick up uh, a few of those and i'll shred those up and i'll keep those in the bottom of the bucket so i'll keep a small layer in there to start off with and then I'll add my food scraps into the bucket. So then when I've got wet food scraps, that material that's already in there is going to soak that up. But you just mainly want some type of brown material or carbonaceous material. So that can be junk mail that you get, newspaper, dead leaves. Um, when you go to the grocery store, if you happen to not use recyclable ones, instead of getting plastic, you can ask for paper grocery bags and shred those up. Those work well, too. Um, but you just want something something that's going to soak up the wetness of the food scraps. So uh, when I'm putting food scraps into my bucket, you know, so I'm chopping up onion, chopping up potato, whatever, uh, and taking them off the cutting board and tossing them in there. Uh, I want to try and make sure that I've got a ratio of about uh, one to one brown to green in the bucket um, so that brown material is going to soak up any excess water. And then it's also the you want to have that brown material keeping the food covered. So by keeping that food covered, you're not going to have uh, fungus gnats and flies and fruit flies that are coming in and landing on that material and laying eggs so that you get more pests in the future in your worm bin. So keeping cover, keeping things covered while you're doing the collection is important. Um, and that's for any scale of composting from in your kitchen to outside to on a huge scale, uh, you know, when composting facilities, large scale composting facilities, when they are receiving food waste, they make sure and get that food waste covered right away so that they're keeping their vectors down like rodents and flies and things like that. Uh, because those wet food waste, that wet food waste is going to attract those types of things. All right. So after we're collecting them, we want to get them ready for the worm bin. So preparing food scraps. Um, there are multiple ways of preparing food scraps. Uh, I am going to mention just a few that are the most common ones. Um, you may have a different way of doing this, and that's great. I'm just happy, and I didn't mean to leave any out. I'm just kind of mentioning the most uh, common ones that I know or that I practice. So when you're preparing your food scraps for the worm bin, the main thing that you want to remember is that um, the worms are really assisting in this process, which I... Uh, mention all the time. Uh, microbes are what are doing the work here. So bacteria and fungi are what are really decomposing these things. And then other organisms that are in the bin, like springtails and roly polies and earthworms and things like that are aiding in the decomposition process by shredding that material down to a smaller size to increase surface area for bacteria and fungi to break them down. So with that in mind, the smaller of particle size that you can get it before you put it in your worm bin, the quicker it's going to break down. So if you can imagine, you know, putting a banana peel into your bin and watching that rot away, a full banana peel, you know, a worm isn't able to chew through a banana peel. So you're relying on the bacteria and fungi to come in, break that down first, and then your worms are going to break through that. But if you were to chop that banana up, increase the surface area, decrease particle size, you're going to make it so that worms are able to chew it up and microorganisms are able to break it down. So what Steve does is he collects things in a bucket, like I had mentioned, and then he takes a trenching shovel, one of those skinny shovels that are really sharp, and he'll keep the material in the bucket and sit there and chop things up into a smaller size um, inside the bucket there. So he's just chopping it up nicely and trying to get a good small consistency to put add that to the worm bin so then it's 
uh, smaller particle size, easier for microorganisms and worms and other things in the bin to then break them down further. What I do personally is to pre-compost things. So um, pre-composting, I'm going to do uh, uh, an episode on this in the future, a live stream on this in the future, but it's very simply putting things through the composting process or the beginning of the composting process to get things to uh, begin decomposition. And then um, you're getting populations of other organisms like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, and then the er worms are eating and getting nutrients from that protozoa. So if we can increase our microbial activity on these things, then we're gonna um, get faster decomposition and digestion uh, of it or processing of it by worms. So what I do is collect things in a bucket in my kitchen, and then I keep a, uh, a four foot a uh, hardware cloth out in my yard that's filled with wood chips. So I just fill it up with wood chips and then I'll bury my bucket into the wood chips and then keep it covered up. And then, you know, next week when I go out, so I'll, uh, I'm going to use my bottle as reference here. Let's say that, you know, this is four feet tall. So when I first start off, I'll just fill up, you know, maybe a third of the way with wood chips. I bury my buckets in there until that whole thing gets filled. And then I'll add some more wood chips on top of that. So fill it another third of the way. And then I'll bury my buckets, you know, once a week, once every other week, however often, um, and just continue to bury those in wood chips and then allow them to break down for a month or two or even longer. Uh, so it's beginning that decomposition process. And then I'll take that stuff and feed it to my worms. Uh, or you can, what's especially good is to put it through the thermophilic phase where you're uh, getting things to heat up to 131 degrees Fahrenheit or 55 degrees Celsius um, for a few days. So that really kicks up the dec decomposition process uh, along with uh, heating things up to kill pathogens and weed seeds that are going to be in that material. Uh, so for pre-composting, again, it's just burying stuff in carbonaceous material. So I mentioned I use wood chips. You could use leaves, uh, so dead leaves from the fall if you collect those in bags, just um, use that to pre-compost your material, add your uh, food waste in. So again, you're thinking about ratios. We put our food waste into the bucket at a ratio of one green to one brown. So then you're just going to want add want to add one more brown part once you get outside and mix those in, if that makes sense, because uh, you've already got the one to one ratio in your bucket. Once you put it into the brown stuff, you're not going to want a ton of brown stuff. Uh, another way that people prepare food scraps for the bin is to freeze fruits and vegetable scraps. So they'll take fruits and vegetable scraps, put them in a bag, put them in the freezer, and through that freezing process, the cells expand, uh, the water freezes, and it bursts. Uh, so this is kind of similar to putting things into a blender, which I'm going to mention next. Uh, but by freezing those food scraps, you kind of turn things into a mush once you take it out and thaw it out. Um, so... That's one way uh, a lot of people don't have extra freezer room, but um, they're concerned about putting things in a bucket and keeping them in their kitchen because of flies and things like that. And if that's a concern for you because of the temperatures or whatever in your area, um, you know, you can uh, freeze food like this. Lots of people do that. Uh, some other people take food scraps and blend them up to uh, make it into a smaller particle size. Uh, you can do that as well. Um, you might want to use a different type of bl a different blender, a uh, separate blender from what you're using for your other food for that stuff. But that's another uh, way of dealing with food scraps and, and breaking that stuff down. And I'm going to mention a thing about that in the next slide here. So that's all preparing food scraps. And now we're going to talk about feeding. So uh, you always want to remember to keep it light when you're adding layers of food. So if you're using fresh food scraps, such as you know blended material frozen material um or things that you haven't even necessarily ripped apart um you know just full avocado shells and banana peels and things like that you're going to want to keep things to more like a quarter of an inch but when, once you're adding extra brown stuff it's going to be about a half an inch layer um so for for anything fresh that's not pre-composted or anything like that things that are really fresh not decomposed decomposed or anything like that, keep it to half an inch or less. Uh, if you're doing pre-composted material, like I mentioned, that stuff's already decomposed. It's got a healthy population of microorganisms on there. And I found that 
uh, I can normally add one to two inches of pre-composted material from a small bin to a large bin. And because of the, because that decomposition process has started, the worms are able to really process that quickly, way quicker than they can fresh food scraps. Uh, and then I wanted to mention, so I'm, I normally am referring to red wigglers in most, uh, if, if, if I'm specific about anything, it's red wigglers. But one thing to mention is that if you're doing African night crawlers, uh, they're going to process things much more quickly. They're voracious feeders. So um, you could add, you know, closer to half to one inch of food materials for African night crawlers because they're going to go through things rather quickly. Remember to uh, keep your ratios of browns to greens. So we want two parts brown to one part green ratio. Um, and again, if you're using the bucket method, like I mentioned, we're already doing a one-to-one -one ratio there. So take that into consideration when you're putting adding more browns as you put that food into the bin. Uh, and then you want to also take into consideration uh, wet parts versus dry parts. So if you've... Um, if you're putting in fresh food scraps without having added any other brown material already, you're going to want to add some dry brown material to soak up the uh, moisture from those food scraps. Um, so when you're adding brown material, it may include some dry and some wet or just some dry that's going to help to soak up materials because we want to try and have a, a moisture of 50% in our worm bins. Uh, so after you've added your food, uh, it's best to just kind of leave it alone for a few days and then check back maybe two days later. I usually like to wait at least three days. Sometimes I'll, I'll even wait a week, um, but check back three days later, see if your worms have processed this. If they haven't processed it, let it go for another three days. Um, what you're wanting to look for is that pool table effect. And uh, this is why I was looking for the uh, live stream or blog post that we did about this so I could reference that because we've got a picture of that, I believe. Um, but the, the pool table effect is where the worms have processed all the material. And uh, instead of being this chunky top to the worm bin, you got this nice smooth, it looks like felt on a pool table and it's nice and level. So that's what that pool table is effect, a pool table effect is. So if you're, if it's not nice and smooth across the top and, and look like it's been processed through worms and nice small particle size, let it go more and let your worms work through that material. Um, and then uh, don't add new food until it's been processed. That's what I was just mentioning. So if, if you were to put food scraps in there, they don't get all processed. And then you're like, oh, well, it's been three days. And I've read that I'm supposed to add food every three days. And then you keep piling food in without the other stuff breaking down. You're likely to get anaerobic conditions where um, things are going to turn acidic and you uh, take the chance of getting um, sauerkraut in your worms and, and killing your worms, actually. Um, so the, by um, making sure that the materials processed before you're adding new foods, you're going to prevent those anaerobic conditions. And then I wanted to mention that you need to be careful with blended foods uh, or foods that have been frozen um, because of the way that they're just a mush. Um, they're going to create, if you were to cover your the top of a worm bin so let's say i'm going to use my phone here let's say my phone is the worm bin um if you were to cover this entire surface area with that mush it's all liquidy mush so it would be like us taking um think like jello if we put a big slab of jello over our mouth uh we wouldn't be able to breathe <laughs> so it's that same way that there's not there's not going to be airflow through this. And so you can cause some issues if you were to cover your entire surface of your bin with blended or frozen mush foods. So if you're, you, if you're doing that with your foods, it's good to just put little pockets. So maybe put a strip down the middle or a few strips or little pockets where you're leaving areas where you're going to allow airflow that worms can come up, get some air, and then go back down. Uh, so I just wanted to make sure and tell people to be aware of that. And with that, we are at the question and answer section. So let me get out of here so I can get to the comments. And I will have to check out the comments and go back through here and see what questions we have. Um, I'm getting a lot of good mornings. Hey, Delaware. Hey, Texas. 
Do I see any drawback of slurry or mush foods only? Uh, I believe I just mentioned that. Um, other than that, uh, other than smothering your worms, if you were to use too much of that, um, I don't see a real issue with it. Uh, just again, keep it light, like any foods, keep it light. So if I, if I were using mush, I would especially keep that to like a quarter inch. Types of wood chips that are good and bad. Um, so generally, if you're getting wood chips in from a place that's, you know, an arborist or something like that, if they've dumped wood chips on your property, it's a it's a mix of things. Um, if they've been doing nothing but cedar trees, you would want to be aware of that because cedar takes a very long time to break down. But um, generally, uh, there's not going to be an issue with other types of trees. Some people have mentioned, um, is it the black walnut tree? I'm having a blank all of a sudden. Uh, that is the allopathic effect that can uh the roots put out chemicals that can be harmful to other plants when it's growing but as far as chipping up the trees and things like that i've read that there's not any issue with um like i said i believe it's the black walnut but i could be mistaken um but yeah i've not had any problems with any types of of wood chips um just like, like i said if someone were to have been doing nothing but chipping down cedar trees you'd want to be aware of that Hey, Sydney, Australia. Glad to hear from somebody in Australia. Uh, uh, looking for more questions here. Hey, from England. Someone says they have tiny little frogs living in their worm bin. That's interesting. Can you please explain more about the risks of adding too much food or food that's not processed yet? Um, uh, that's what I was... Let me get out of this part right here. I'll see so you all can see my big mug here. Um, again, adding too much food at one time. Uh, so if you're adding way too much food that the worms and microorganisms aren't going to be able to process in, you know, a week or so, week or two, uh, or if you're adding food and then just keep adding food without that stuff breaking down, um, or if you were to add a bunch of food scraps without adding brown material, uh, you're going to likely create conditions that are going to turn anaerobic and you're going to have anaerobic microorganisms tr uh, take over. And um, what happens is you're likely to have the pH start to go acidic because of the um, enzymes and things that these uh, bacteria, anaerobic bacteria and other organisms are putting out. Um, and once that starts to happen, um, you can get fermentation in your worms. So that's the, the biggest issue that people worry about is sauerkraut or protein poisoning. And what's actually happening is uh, fermentation is taking place in the worm's body where they're eating this stuff that is acidic and anaerobic. And then, um, not to be gross, but worms aren't able to burp or fart like humans are. So this gas just starts to expand. I think that happens with mice too. Don't people like torture mice that way with Coca-Cola or something. Um, they're not able to burp or anything and release this gas. So then they start to get this string of pearls look uh, where they get uh, protein, what's called protein poisoning or sour crop, and they um, can become very fragile and break apart and die and things like that. So that's why you want to make sure and limit your food uh, and make sure that worms are processing food before you're adding more food. Uh, Kevin asks, what kind of percentages for neem cakes in the bedding? I would have not, I would have no clue what to tell you for percentages for neem cake. Um, and I'm unsure why you're wanting to add neem cake to the bedding. Do, uh, do worms eat more or less in the summer versus the winter? So there's a, and we did a live stream about that as well. Um, I believe it was the summer worm, uh, composting tips possibly. Um, there's a sweet spot. It's about. 60 to 90 degrees where in there worms are going to be active and the most active right in the middle at like 70 75 degrees where they're really chewing through stuff quickly processing stuff quickly um and then once you get colder move colder and colder they're going to slow down progressively more as things get colder or if things get too hot like 90 degrees or above they're going to also slow down in those types of temperatures um what should i feed regularly what should I feed red wigglers to fatten them up? Most people are using a commercial worm chow to help fatten worms up uh, if they're wanting to sell them for fishing or use them for fishing. 
Um, trying to look at the, the comments, keep moving here. Is the two to one carbon to nitrogen ratio by weight or by volume? Thank you for asking that. That would be by volume because the weight's gonna depend on the moisture content. So that would be by volume. So if you've got a, a fistful of food waste, a fistful of brown material or uh, same, same volume, not weight. What's a better pre-compost method, hot bin versus Bokashi? I don't like Bokashi because it only uses um, lactobacillus and uh, any other other types of composting methods like that's going to include air, aerobic uh, composting methods are going to add more diversity of microorganisms versus the Bokashi. So I prefer anything other than Bokashi or those anaerobic methods. Uh, should you cook the foods like pumpkin before freezing? Uh, I don't think that it really matters um, because the same thing is going to happen no matter what uh, once you freeze them due to the water. Is it okay to mix up, fluff the whole box every once in a while to, to aerate it? Uh, yeah, so the worms and microorganisms are going to kind of be thrown into uh, just like if we had an earthquake or something like that, it's going to take them a, a day or two to get settled back down where they're, they're going to uh, process things just as quickly, but uh, it is, I've noticed that with my bins, they do start to compact if you've got deeper bins and not shallow bins. Um, and it's good to go in there with like one of those three pronged um, gardening hoe things, that, like the handheld ones and kind of just pull up that and loosen it up. I, I do have found that that is helpful. Uh, I think my bin is getting compacted. Should I stir it up? Uh, just to answer that. Uh, I would only add browns if you're having issues with um, a moisture. Otherwise, just stir it up. Hey, South Africa. Uh, I'm doing a batch feeding pre-compost. Is there anything to be wary of? No heat is given off. Um, it, if you're pre-composting, it doesn't matter if it heats up or not. Um, the, the, the thermophilic process or getting compost to heat up is going to help to kill pathogens. Um, if you're getting above that 131 degrees, but otherwise, like I said, I'm not doing hot composting. I'm just doing static composting. So I'm letting, putting stuff, uh, putting stuff in a pile and letting it break down over so long. What would you comment on using Bokashi? I already answered that. Um, chicken, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that uh, I'm getting through the questions here. Is it okay to feed my worms sourdough discard and kombucha scoby? Um, I would probably let the sourdough stuff dry out and then maybe crumble it up because uh, it might kind of react somewhat weird in the worm bin if you were to just put the dough part in there. The kombucha scoby, I would probably chop that up into smaller parts, but I wouldn't see any issue with uh, you know drying it out a little bit, chopping it up and putting it in there. It's going to add more biology too. If it has been weeks since I partially composted material from a tumbler and a worm's not gone through it, can I maybe add more worms? Um, sure, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of variables there, so it depends on kind of how many worms you have. Um, let's see here. Can you feed worms organic dry amendments made from vegetative stage of a plant? Uh, so I'm guessing you mean like, um, dehydrated foods and yeah, that would be totally cool. I mean, anything that's organic can be fed to worms. It doesn't really matter wet or dry as long as it hasn't been salted a ton or something like that. Um, is it better to bury the food or top feed? So, um, I like to top feed. You can bury food if you want. There's not going to be a ton of difference. Um, if you're top feeding, so you're adding food scraps and then putting some brown material on top of that, um, that's going to be just as good. Usually people are wanting to bury food um, by, well, you may get a little bit quicker breakdown if you're able to bury some of the food because by burying it, you're putting it in a situation where it's going to be surrounded by more microorganisms, where if you're just, if you've got your top layer of your bin here and you're putting, you know, lettuce, carrot pieces and stuff like that on top, uh, all of their surface area isn't necessarily going to be touching where the microorganisms are in the bin. So by burying it, you're going to coat more of the surface area with those microorganisms. So it may get a, a little bit quicker breakdown, but uh, either way should be fine. Uh, doo -doo -doo -doo. 
Oh uh, yeah, someone said Black Walnut produces Juglone. I always forget the name of that. Thank you. And it is it must be Black Walnut. So it produces it through the roots though. I've done through my research as far as I know, I'm not saying this is the truth, but as far as I know and what I've read, it only produces it from a live tree through the roots, um not necessarily through other parts of the plant. So uh it would only really affect other plants that are in the ground growing near those. Um, so it's not going to be in wood chips and things like that once you chop a tree down and start to cut it up. Um, I'm, it says worms don't chew through anything. I'm not sure if they're talking about me using the worm chew because I normally throw quotation marks in there when I say chew. Uh, they don't have any teeth, but they're using their mouth part to suck things in. But that's, again, why you wouldn't, uh, why it's a lot better to not put in full food scraps. Noxious weed-free alfalfa is a no-go for compost, question mark. Um, alfalfa can be treated by herbicide, so I would just, yeah, any type of alfalfa or um, food, grass, forage that are used for um, herbivores, cows, horses, um, you need to be wary of having uh, herbicide, especially persistent herbicides, having been uh sprayed on those fields. So you need to know your farmer and trust the person who grows that stuff. Uh, can I add dizzied plants to my worm bin? I think that's supposed to be diseased plants. Um, I'm not sure what dizzied is. Um, I, if you have diseased plants, I would either burn them or put them through the hot composting process, depending on what type of plant and what type of disease. Can I put fish blood bone? Yes, any uh, anything that's organic, I would uh, limit uh, blood and high nitrogen, things like that to very small amounts because that's gonna help to heat up the uh, worm bin. Watching from Zimbabwe, welcome from Zimbabwe. That's awesome. I love hearing people who are in other parts of the world. What's the best food to make African night crawlers multiply fast? Uh, I can't say that I know the answer to that. I know for most worms, a lot of people use cooked rice, um, so they'll cook rice. Um, those sugars and starches really help to get microorganisms going, which it helps to attract worms. And so that helps to bring worms together so they're more likely to mate and things like that. Um, I'm not the best person to ask that question about. I can try and find out the answer if there's anything better than rice um, and get back uh, and post that about something. But other than that, I'm not sure somebody put Viagra. Um, and it looks like that. Uh, with that, I'm at the end of the questions here. Greetings from Romania. Thanks for checking in. Um, thank you for uh, thank you for attending this Wiggle Wednesday, or for anyone who's viewing it in the future. Thanks for viewing it. Uh, I hope you all learned something. Um, we are going to take a couple weeks break here and be back. I believe it's January fourth is the Wednesday, and we are going to be talking about. Uh, I mentioned it last time in our Wednesday and I'm having a blank right now. Oh, storing worm castings. Uh, once you harvest your worm castings, how do you store them? How long can you store them? What are ways to store them? Things like that. So we'll be back after the first of the year and be talking about storing worm castings. So join us then. Uh, I'll be putting it out on social media. In the meantime, check out social media, check out our YouTube channel for other videos and Again, thanks for joining in today. Have a blessed day and happy holidays and happy new year. I'll see you after the new year. Thank you.